Hello, everyone. Uh, this is our lecture for November 16th. We're going to be talking about rebellion in the 1970s uh, within the labor movement, specifically uh, rebellion in something called the long 1970s. Uh, the long 1970s is a, is a term that some historians, particularly uh, labor historians, will use to refer to the 1970s and conditions that happened in the 1970s that kind of led to a decline in the overall power of the labor movement. Um, but we call it the long 1970s because it really uh, starts before the 1970s take place. Um, depending on who you ask, the long 1970s start in 1965 or 66. Uh, sometimes even earlier than that. Uh, but most commonly, they start in uh, 1968 uh, with the election of Richard Nixon to the presidency, um, beating out the, the Democratic nominee for president. 1968 is often cited as the end of the labor liberal coalition or the New Deal coalition, this, uh, this force that has kind of guided government politics over the last uh, two lectures that we've had and has, ri had, has contributed to the rise of the labor movement. So for the better part of three decades up to four decades, you have this, uh, this party alignment called the New Deal Coalition, where the Democrats and the labor movement have uh, a majority, not a monopoly, but a lot of political power. And with the, uh, with the emergence of the 1970s and the breakup of this coalition, you start to see the labor movement go into retreat. The long 1970s will actually uh, usually runs until 1981 with the election of Ronald Reagan. Um, in the, throughout the 1980s, the power of the labor movement takes kind of an even sharper downturn, uh, but the long 1970s is really the period that a lot of historians focus on as the turning point of the labor movement. Whether or not this turning point is earlier or later is still actually a, a source of a lot of historical debate. So I won't get too much into what my opinions there are, but I will be presenting you with a, a bit of information that um, can contextualize those arguments. You know, there are people who will say the, this downturn occurred before, there are people who will say this downturn occurred in the 70s, and uh, my hope is that after this lecture you'll understand the reasons behind both arguments. It's also worth pointing out that we're going to be talking about some things uh, that took place a little bit before the 1970s, like the 1950 Treaty of Detroit. That's just for uh, um, one, for contextual purposes, so you kind of know what the rest of the lecture is going to be about when I refer to these things. We didn't get a chance to talk about them at the last lecture, and that's just because we kind of had a lot to get through. So um, the second part of that is just kind of uh, wrapping up things that we didn't get to in the last lecture, like the Treaty of Detroit, and how that kind of paved the way for these later disagreements over whether unions should be business unions or social unions, and we'll talk about that too. But yeah, just uh, like, uh, like I said, a lot of this is going to be picking up right when the last uh, lecture on World War II and uh, the post-war labor movement, when that lecture started to kind of end, we're going to be picking up right there. So it's worth ref uh, refreshing our memories of that last lecture, right? Um, first point you should remember is that the Taft-Hartley Act passed in 1947, greatly limited the power of the American labor movement. Um, when this was combined with the Red Scare and the defeat of the CIO's Operation Dixie, uh, the CIO wasn't alone there. The AFL had their kind of sister program that was a little less financed, but it was still there. Uh, but the Red Scare and the defeat of these operations um, really put unions on the defensive uh, after the 1940s and into the 1950s. Some of this stemmed from the fact that after World War II, there was a pretty big debate on who was included in the labor movement, who's, uh, who had a right to certain kind of breadwinner or family wage jobs and who didn't. The prevailing idea at the time was that men who were stereotypically the heads of their household had some kind of birthright to these very high paying union manufacturing jobs um, that were protected by the USW, uh, the UAW, or the UMWA, the idea being that if you were a man, it was assumed that you had a wife and children to care for, whereas if you were a woman, obviously you would not have these things. Uh, these kinds of assumptions, of course, left out all of uh, the single mothers who maybe were unmarried or were widowed, but still had to keep uh, take care of their families. It um, overlooked people who might not have been in a family 
unit, but for any number of reasons might have needed extra income for their own purposes. So it's a very, um, what we sometimes call heteronormative aspect. Uh, it's a very heteronormative outlook. It privileges the, uh, the straight heterosexual family unit as kind of like this building block of society. And the, obviously the labor movement is going to appeal to that group of workers and not necessarily other groups of workers. This isn't an assumption that was adopted without any, any kind of fight. A lot of women, um, especially in the UAW, as we learned in our last lecture, actively sought to retain their jobs, retain their union membership, and fight for gender equality, uh, both in unions and on, um, on the shop floor. There would be varying degrees of success and, um, and failure for these, these efforts, but they were all there nonetheless. And we kind of left off our lecture last week with the merger of the AFL and the CIO. This was done ostensibly to, to ensure that the labor movement had more political power. Um, going into the 1950s, after the Red Scare ending the year earlier with the Army McCarthy hearings in 1954, the labor movement had taken like a number of pretty serious blows. And so the merger of the AFL and CIO appeared to a lot of people like just a common sense approach to make sure the labor movement still had political power. But critics of that move uh, looked at the, um, at the structure of the AFL as being less democratic than the CIO and less inclusive than the CIO. And so there were they were worried that a merger of those two federations might um, kind of smother chances at reform or widening the labor movement. Whether or not those criticisms were well-founded, historians might still debate on today. But you can kind of see there's a discrepancy uh, running throughout the AFL and CIO's competition between craft and industrial unionism. And when these two federations merge, they're kind of forced into making craft and industrial unionism work together. And whether or not that's a long-term recipe for success is, is really a matter of debate also. And of course, before we jump into things, I'm going to uh, provide a couple of reading recommendations. If the long 1970s and labor uprisings and rebellions are particularly interesting to you, both of these books, I think, um, you will enjoy. The first is Rebel Rank and File. It's actually a pretty recent work. I say pretty recent, it came out about 10 years ago. But it's a collection of labor history essays that kind of look at the labor movement in the United States um, through this period. And they look, uh, each essay kind of looks at a different, um, a different rebellion within the labor movement and kind of gives it a uh, focus for that essay. So if you are interested in teacher strikes in the long 1970s, uh, I believe there are two chapters in there on, on that. If you're interested about black power organizations kind of fighting white supremacy on the shop floor in the auto industry, there I believe are one or two chapters on that. If that latter topic is especially interesting to you, um, given that a lot of us live in Detroit, we're studying in Detroit, Wayne State is uh, a university at the heart of the city of Detroit, if that specific geographic locality is interesting to you, then I would of course also recommend Detroit I Do Mind Dying, a study in urban revolution. Detroit I Do Mind Dying is a historical account of an organization that we're going to talk about today called the uh, League of Revolutionary Black Workers or LRBW. It actually started off as a slightly smaller organization focused around Chrysler's Dodge main plant, which would have been in today's Hamtramck. Uh, called the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, or DRUM. That uh, organization caught, um, caught a lot of growth. Um, it appealed to a lot of people who were incredibly frustrated with kind of this entrenched, bureau, uh, what they perceived as entrenched bureaucracy, um, entrenched racial discrimination, entrenched sexism within uh, the UAW as well as within uh, the manufacturing industry as a whole, and they sought to correct those issues. So uh, that's definitely a book I would recommend, uh, recommend reading, even if you're not interested necessarily in the history of the uh, auto unions or of the labor movement. As a, as a Detroiter, it's a kind of a, a cornerstone work for understanding our city's history also. So definitely check that out if you have some free time. But right, let's jump uh, right into things, right? 
we're going to talk about the Treaty of Detroit and this rise of what um, today some people refer to as business unionism. So after World War II, we see this Red Scare uh, start to deepen and unions and businesses in the post-war uh, order are really starting to kind of battle it out over things like wage rates, benefits, um, the pace of, of production, all of these different things. Now that we have a National Labor Relations Board to kind of arbitrate this bargaining process, we have the right of workers to form unions in the National Labor Relations Act or the Wagner Act in 1935, if you recall. Now that workers have this formal process through which they can organize and negotiate over their pay, the process of, uh, of actual contract bargaining gets pretty mucky pretty quick. And this is for a lot of different reasons. One is that up until Taft-Hartley, what specifically a union can bargain on, what specific actions they can take in the bargaining process is still up in the air. In the Great Depression, of course, sit-down strikes uh, were legal, or if they weren't legal, unions and workers, uh, by working together, made them legal on kind of a de facto basis. Um, the Flint sit-down strike won workers uh, the right to join the UAW. The Little Steel strikes in Illinois and um, the strikes at U.S. Steel won, uh, made sure that the United Steel workers had their union. But how often do you negotiate over a contract? For a lot of workplaces, it was every single year, right? So there'd be a 1946 contract, there'd be a 1947 contract. And whenever progress couldn't be made on these contracts, ultimately, um, a lot of times, work would stop, right? Unions would call a strike, your uh, business isn't bargaining in good faith with us, um, and so we're going to walk out and a business would turn around usually and negotiate with, with the union or they would try and entice people back into the shops wherever they could um, to kind of uh, break the union through, um, through labor that, uh, that wasn't represented by the union. Taft-Hartley specifically allowed uh, more and more employers to, um, to do this. Uh, in the South, you start to see the passage of a lot of right to work laws that allowed, worker, that allowed employers to basically circumvent the bargaining process with unions and hire strike breakers in order to keep their businesses running. So whether or not an employer could do this had, uh, could depend on how um, amenable they were to negotiating with a union. But also, you know, unions would not only discuss uh, things like wages and benefits, but they would actively call for workers participation in, um, in guiding the policy of companies. This uh, is kind of that, it falls into that category of industrial democracy, right? So it's not as, uh, it's not as radical of a call for industrial democracy as you might see uh, coming from an organization like the IWW, but other industrial unions might call for uh, an industrial democracy light, if you will, right? Um, maybe workers shouldn't own the factories, but you know, uh, workers, uh, representatives in the union should be able to meet with management and they should be able to debate over how fast the line goes, right? How many pieces per hour should, should an employee be required to, to produce? Um, these sorts of things, the idea that, uh, that a labor union and that workers collectively could approach management and talk and debate and, and negotiate over uh, the, the specific aspects of how something was made in a factory um, was a pretty radical concept. And it was something that not all unions would try to negotiate for, but those that did, they could just as easily strike over it if, um, if they had the, the, the political power to do so. So you have a lot of recurring negotiations, right, is what this boils down to. You have a lot of recurring negotiations. You have a lot of industries in the post-war era that are, one, kind of retooling away from defense production and back to a peacetime economy. So, you know, Ford isn't making tanks anymore. They have to revamp their entire factory to go back to making the F-150 or, um, or whatever uh, car they were making in that specific plant. Not every Ford plant makes an F-150, of course. Same thing with Chrysler and GM. Uh, but even outside the auto industry, in you know the production of steel, the production of rubber, in uh, locomotive engineers, right, rail workers, people who work on the railroad, 
all of these different workers are now that World War II is over, they're facing um, these post-war uh, wage cuts. They're facing they're facing cuts in hours. They're facing kind of management trying to reassert itself uh, as the sole kind of voice that guides uh, the process of production. And unions aren't really wanting to give that up, right? Throughout the World War II era and to a lesser extent during the Great Depression, kind of pre-World War II, unions and government and business had all kind of collaborated on how best for the national economy production could be guided. Now, now businesses don't want this anymore, right? Now that, uh, now that World War II is over, now that the fascists and the Nazis are defeated, there's uh, kind of similar to World War I, there's this call for a return to normalcy. And even though some unions continue to call for a cooperative form of management that would include workers in decision-making processes, businesses aren't really going to be amenable to listening to this type of thing. So you may have recalled from our last uh, lecture, one of the books I recommended was called uh, Disruption in Detroit. And it was very much uh, kind of an oral history. So it had these testimonies from auto workers who were alive in the 1940s and 50s, but it was also you know, more than an oral history. There was a, there was a definite narrative there that kind of, uh, and if you didn't read this, I'm kind of giving you the cliff notes here. There is a narrative there that told us that even though there's these arguments, there's this historical understanding that post-World War II, there was a huge economic boom. Um, workers in Detroit, workers in, uh, in industries represented by industrial unions didn't necessarily benefit from that post-war boom. Not immediately, at least, right? Um, workers, again, to reiterate um, something that I said a couple slides ago, they very much did not have regular full-time hours, right? They would be put on part-time a lot of the time or they might be laid off. And some of this just stemmed from the fact that when you are retooling a plant for peacetime production, you don't need as many workers, right? If the machines aren't running, then you don't wanna pay people to be there. But even more than that, during the World War II era, there was uh, what some economists would refer to as overemployment. So if you're making planes and and trucks and tanks at Ford's Rouge complex, and you need you know, between 40 and 50,000 workers to produce those things. Well, at the Ford Rouge complex at its height, it had 100,000 workers. And that was basically to make sure that no matter what happened, if workers called off, if there was a wildcat strike, if someone was sick or if people had to go home, that you would always have enough workers to keep those factories running at the maximum capacity that they could. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of memoirs written in the World War II era of defense workers who Elizabeth Hawes, uh, if you recall from last, last lecture, was one, but there are, of course, others who wrote about basically standing around waiting in these factories for jobs to do because there were so many people employed at work. And so with a reconversion to a peacetime economy, a lot of people who uh, did have high paying jobs in that capacity were laid off just because even once these factories are retooled, their labor just isn't necessarily needed. So a lot of people are facing, are facing layoffs. A lot of people are, pace, are facing um, hours cuts. They're facing wage cuts. And so there's a real big push by a lot of labor unions to basically protect the living standards that workers had come to expect in the World War II era, where you had kind of these, these guarantees of a job if you were willing to work for one. In the peacetime economy, that's you know, that's not necessarily the case. You have a lot of people coming back from Europe and you have uh, the demands for a peacetime economy that are kind of different from a wartime economy, right? Making as many tanks as we can isn't necessarily the only goal now. Now we kind of have to rein in spending, rein in all of this debt that we, uh, we acquired from fighting a world war. And how do we make our economy sound and profitable again? So of course, as with any small plant in an entire industry and in an entire economy, when you have a lot of businesses saying, we don't want as many workers, we want to pay them less, and we, uh, and we want basically greater rights over the, over the role of production, and you have a lot of workers saying the exact opposite things, this leads to a lot of strikes. And this, kinds of man this manifests in the 1945 through 47 uh, um, post-war strike wave, 
that leads to Taft-Hartley, right? Now, the kinds of solutions that the labor movement is giving to the American public, not only to the US government and to US businesses, but to you know, people who vote. Ostensibly, if you're voting, right, you're going to be picking the representatives who are going to be guiding public policy, making decisions for the, for the government. Labor activists argued that if you want economic growth, if you want to make a good uh, transition to a peacetime recovery, the best way to do that is to pursue a policy of full employment. Um, if you have too many workers uh, for the amount of labor that's needed totally, then you simply reduce everyone's work hours, right? This idea being that as the uh, as Ford, I only need a thousand workers, and if they're working uh, 40 hours a week, then I only need a thousand workers, period. The union would turn around and say, well, you know, there are 1,300 people who need a job. So if you have everyone work 30 hours a week, all 1,300 of those people can have employment. That's that idea of full employment, right? Um, that, of course, would eat into the bottom line of industries like Ford, who now have to pay for 300 more workers than they normally would. But then if they would say, hey, all of these workers aren't necessarily essential for us and we don't want to pay for 300 extra workers if we don't need them, um, the union would turn around and basically say, well, uh, you should still pay for those workers uh, because all of these labor-saving technologies that we've discovered in World War II, all of these labor-saving processes like the assembly line, enable a company to churn out uh, much more of a product with less amounts of labor, right, this early process of automation. And so if you're making more money because we're making more things, you should be paying out more in wages, not less or the same amount. If you want a good uh, kind of side-by-side -side comparison, you kind of have to think of the overproduction aspect of the Great Depression and in farming, right, in agriculture. If you're producing so much that you need less and less people working, paying fewer people to work isn't actually going to help because there's not going to be enough fully employed people with, uh, with disposable income to buy your products to keep the economy going. This is called uh, demand side economics, right? The idea that um, the economic growth is dependent on consumer demand, which is made possible or can be grown by increases in wages and uh, assurances of full employment. Supply side economics is kind of this opposite lens this opposite argument that says, you know, only companies should have a uh, say over how the economy is organized because they're the ones that supply all of the goods. So you see these demands for greater cooperation in government uh, between the unions, uh, labor movement, and these businesses. You see the UAW um, advocating for the 30 hour work week and basically government assurances of, of uh, guaranteed full employment. This ultimately doesn't happen, of course. You see, for one, we don't have the 30-hour work week today. Uh, but the Red Scare, Taft-Hartley, and the failure of this Operation Dixie really just kind of saps the labor movement of its bargaining strength. And so it's not able to really push through these initiatives. And with ramping up the Cold War, more radical calls for kind of government planning of the economy like this just, you know, they, a lot of Americans turn their backs on it. So you have a lot of companies saying, absolutely, no way are we going to negotiate how we run our business with you, your workers. And if you want to organize into unions, you know, you can absolutely do that. We can negotiate on things like, like pay and benefits, but we're not gonna negotiate on how we run our business. This kind of puts a lot of unions in a bind. And after 1947, when they don't really have the ability as much to contest management's position here, there's pressure on them to settle for less than they might actually want to. So you have these annual, uh, these annual agreements between these unions and these businesses. They're very often leading to strikes even after Taft-Hartley. Um, these strikes actually kind of spread throughout other forms of industry. So if there's a strike in the steel industry, right? Or if there's a strike in the rubber industry and suddenly there are 
there's less steel frames, there's less rubber tires. Even if the auto industry isn't striking, if they don't have the materials to make cars, then that translates into a stoppage in the auto industry as well. So a lot of these annual strikes are kind of piggybacking off of each other and they're making economic, they're kind of stymieing economic growth a little bit is what economic historians will tell you. This leads uh, the UAW ultimately in 1950 to negotiate something called the Treaty of Detroit. The Treaty of Detroit was a long-term five-year contract. So it's not a contract that's negotiated every year, it's every five years. It's a long-term five-year contract between the UAW and big three automakers, where the UAW agreed to abandon um, their specific rights to bargain on some issues in exchange for extensive benefits and wage increases. So businesses and unions at this time are kind of coming to a head. Businesses are saying, absolutely not, we're not going to let you negotiate over, over how we run production. Unions are saying, well, we really, really want this because we had it in World War II and it worked really great and you're really just trying to, to double back on this because you're greedy. Truth might be somewhere in the middle there. When the UAW approaches Ford, GM, and Chrysler and says, hey, we'll go ahead and drop these calls for, uh, for cooperative control of production, all of these industries kind of turn to the UAW and say, well, what do you want? The UAW is able to actually negotiate a lot of things for its members, right? So in exchange for us dropping, you know, calls for guiding production of cars or like determining how many cars we're going to produce or where factories can be located, we're just going to want uh, better pay increases, right? We want to be able to make enough money to buy our own homes. Um, we want health care. One of the first national health, uh, not national, but one of the first widespread health uh, plans made available for workers comes out of the Treaty of Detroit when the UAW forces these big three manufacturers to basically provide men, uh, medical care and health insurance to its workers. Um, things like pensions are one. COLA, which is known as a cost of living adjustment, basically. If, if uh, inflation goes up a certain amount, Right. If a if a gallon of milk was fifty cents last year and now it's sixty five cents, that means that you know the going price of certain commodities are increasing. That means wages should, should increase. And so, you, for a while at least, they don't necessarily have cola in a lot of auto contracts anymore. But for a while, you know, if if inflation kept going up, your wages would go up pegged to inflation. It was called a cost of living adjustment. Things like vacation time. So the Treaty of Detroit won UAW members um, a, lot of, a lot of benefits in exchange for kind of dropping this idea of cooperative management. And ultimately what this does is it contributes to a similar practice throughout uh, the rest of the manufacturing industry. And in fact, throughout a lot of the economy where people, where companies are negotiating with labor unions over some of these issues, right? It provides a framework after 1950 for companies to approach workers and say, hey, if you drop this cooperative management stuff, we'll give you a pay increase, we'll give you unemployment compensation, we'll give you vacation time. We'll make sure you have a pension and health care for when you retire. You know, retirement becomes a possibility for the average American worker that wasn't necessarily possible before. We'll make sure if there's an economic crash, if we're still in business, you can have a cost of living adjustment. So more than just being related to the auto industry, these standards spread to other industries, right? Uh, steel workers start to see some of these benefits, coal workers, coal miners, less so, but still some of these benefits start to make their way uh, into this union compensation. Coal workers, of course, are not, coal miners are not paid nearly as well as auto workers at this time, but they are starting to win similar concessions. There's also this concept of the prevailing wage, right? There's this idea at the time that if an employer wants to hire someone, they need to be able to offer a certain amount in compensation in order to, uh, in order to attract good workers. Because if I'm a good worker, why am I going to work for, you know, a uh, dollar an hour at this manufacturer with no, uh, no pension, no benefits, no health care, if I can go to a union manufacturer that offers these things and also I get $2 an hour. 
you know, why would I work at this non-union company? So there's this idea of prevailing wage and prevailing compensation, where even if you aren't in a unionized industry, employers still have to start paying you a little bit more if they want to keep you around. So the Treaty of Detroit very quickly becomes kind of this, this cornerstone uh, that guides labor negotiations and the labor movement and collective bargaining policy for like the second half of the 20th century, right? But you have to keep in mind that this concession isn't free, right? All of these, all of these benefits, these pay increases, vacation time, COLA, they don't come uh, with no kind of payment due. By giving up their right to negotiate certain things with companies like where production is based or how hiring works in a factory. The labor movement in a lot of ways is giving up some things and it's worth talking about this. Right, so by signing the Treaty of Detroit and other uh, similar long-term contracts with auto manufacturers, the UAW and the rest of the labor movement is kind of forced to accepting some clear boundaries regarding what was and was not a union or bargaining issue, right? What's a management right and what's a bargaining issue? A management right are basically these core rights to determine an organization's mission, budget, strategy, operations, right to assign, direct, and fire workers. In a lot of collective bargaining agreements today, you'll see sections on management rights, and it's basically things that the union has agreed they can't fight employers on. Now, by acknowledging that management has certain rights, this kind of, by limiting what a union can negotiate and bargain, it kind of boxes a union in um, regarding what it should actually make as its priority. This is uh, what we see as the emergence of a kind of business unionism. So if we're talking about this, right, what is business unionism? Sometimes referred to as pure and simple unionism or more often bread and butter unionism. Business unionism basically says that a union or the labor movement should only concern itself with the work, the workers that it represents, right? With the specific workplace issues like safety, wages, and benefits. My union local, right? Local 6115 has 500 workers, right? As a local of a union, should I be primarily concerned with the wages and benefits and livelihoods of those 500 workers? Business unions would say yes, right? Workers pay dues into your local. It's ultimately to those workers that, you're, that you are responsible to. On the flip side of this, something that we see a little bit um, prior to Taft-Hartley, prior to the Red Scare, that we really see in Operation Dixie, right? Um, contrary to business unionism is social unionism. Social unionism, sometimes referred to as social movement unionism, basically says the opposite. It says that the labor movement should concern itself with everyone, the welfare of all workers, regardless of their employment, their affiliation with your specific local, all workers and the benefits of the entire working class should be the main priority of the labor movement, right? So you can, you can advocate for workers outside of your specific bargaining unit by striking or by protesting, by uh, legislative lobbying through something called PACs or political action committees. If you believe in business unionism, right, this idea that your labor union is only responsible to the workers you are representing, that means you're less likely to tackle social issues. This is something we were able to discuss in class um, during our, our class discussion a week or so ago. These are our dues paying members. These are the people that we're, that we're worried about. Social unionists, on the other hand, would look at the political situation across the entire country and say, what do we need to do to make the labor movement stronger? What do we need to do to organize more workers? Now this set might seem more egalitarian to some folks, but when you start running up against the Red Scare, the failures of Operation Dixie and Taft-Hartley, social unionists are kind of pushed to the background, right? Especially after the Treaty of Detroit, you know, you can't negotiate for workers outside of your bargaining unit as one of these management rights, right? You can't say where we have a factory 
or how fast we make the line run or um, how we market our products in other states. There's only so many things the union can do. And so social unionists kind of fall out of power at this point in time. More and more unions start to turn to this Treaty of Detroit business unionism. How can we represent our workers? Now for the industrial union movement, for workers in the UAW or the USW or the UMWA or any of these other industrial unions, business unionism serves them very well. You have millions of Americans who are in the post-war era able to buy a house for the first time. Home ownership was not necessarily something that was common before the post-war era. The labor uh, movement and business unionism specifically make this possible. They aren't the only things making this possible, but they make it more likely for people to be able to afford these kinds of things. Same thing with healthcare and pensions. So this is probably uh, the leading contestation actually today in the labor movement is is a union a business union or a social or a social union should a union be more concerned with the compensation and well-being of its immediate members or should they be looking at a different picture your answer on that depends on your own priorities and what you think the labor movement uh, should be responsible for right So you have all of these good positive things coming out of business unionism. You have home ownership, you have vacation times, you have you know, families who are frugal and saving a lot of money can maybe buy a cabin up in North Michigan somewhere to go to for summer vacations, which you can now enjoy with vacation time. And you can retire to this cabin once you have, uh, once you have your pension, you're 30 and out. But on the flip side of this, If a union takes a, a business union approach, if there are only so many things they can negotiate on, then that limits the, the amount or the degree to which unions can negotiate with employers for more wide ranging, uh, over more wide ranging causes. So let's talk about labor in the 1960s, right? Social justice, social reforms talked about Operation Dixie last lecture. And while it's only met with minimal success, the labor movement does not abandon the emerging civil rights movement. A lot of unionists, specifically industrial unions, people involved in industrial unions, uh, saw the civil rights movement as uh, necessary for the success of labor unions. Especially in the United States South, but really all across the entire country, divisions over race and racial identity, as well as sex and gender, served as a very convenient way for workers to kind of, or for employers to kind of pit workers against one another, right? Prior to the UAW arriving at Ford, Ford routinely, if there was a walkout, if there was a wildcat strike, if there was a labor stoppage, Ford would fall back on hiring marginalized African-American black workers in order to keep the line running, and they would pay them lower rates to do that. Now, this isn't you know, black workers were in the economic situation that they were in. And a lot of times taking these kinds of strike breaking jobs that Ford offered was the only possible way to get into some of these well, -pay well paying um, factory jobs because otherwise, because of racial discrimination, you know, you wouldn't make it past the factory gates. They keep you out at the front door. Even once workers actually got in to factories uh, at places like Ford, they would often be kind of uh, secluded and pushed to like the least paying and most dangerous jobs in places like the foundry. But the ability of employers to kind of use racial discrimination and racism to pit workers against each other for their own benefit is a recurring theme in, in American history, if, uh, if that's shown up at all in these past couple lectures. And so a lot of people in the labor movement look at the civil rights movement and say, you know what, this is something that we need to encourage. This is something we need to support. But if you are a business union, the means by which you can support something like the civil rights movement is a little bit diminished, isn't it? So you can conduct public outreach campaigns. You can conduct labor education classes. You can, you know, you can go around neighborhoods and you can knock on doors and you can canvas and you can try to get out the vote. But as a labor union, can you strike over 
the right to have a say in who's hired into a plant? Well, because of Taft-Hartley and the Treaty of Detroit, the possibility of a labor movement being able, or a labor union being able to do that is decreasing, right? Hiring isn't a collective bargaining issue, it's a management right. Only we get to decide who gets fired. Promotions are not a collective bargaining right, it's a management, or a collective bargaining issue, it's a management right. Only managers get to determine who gets, who gets promoted. So you start to see how business unionism, despite all of these economic benefits for workers who are already organized, starts to have its drawbacks. In 1954, of course, we see the end of the second Red Scare. A lot of historians will say 1954 in the Army McCarthy hearings, have you no decency, sir? Very uh, good night and good luck. They look at 1954 as the end of the Second Red Scare. Some historians will put it at 1960, but by 1954, the majority of it is, is starting to wind down. In 1954, we also see uh, the Brown v. Board of Education, Supreme Court ruling. Prior to Brown v. Board, uh, the entire Southern United States had uh, segregation uh, in education, not only just in availability, but it was required. If you were in Little Rock, Arkansas, up until 1954, the law said that you could not have integrated schools. What people often forget, however, is that segregation wasn't just a phenomenon that was limited to the Southern United States, right? There were a lot of states, if you see the map here on the left, where segregation was optional. So you might live in Oregon, and even though segregation was not required in Oregon, you might be in a district that was particularly not interested in, in racial equality that would also pursue a segregationist policy, not only in education, but in other aspects of life, right? The, ma the, the majority of states at this time either required or allowed for segregation in education. Now, as you also can see on this map, there were a couple of uh, states where segregation was specifically forbidden, but this was a, these were state codes and state laws that, for, that forbade de jure discrimination, right? De jure segregation. And there's a difference between de jure and de facto. If you don't already know, um, I think we've mentioned maybe once or twice in this, in this semester already, but it bears repeating that whether or not some, that whether or not discrimination or segregation or repression occurs, just because it's not on the books doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, right? So a state can ban du jour discrimination, right? It's not legal to discriminate. It's not legal to enforce segregation, but that doesn't mean that there isn't de facto segregation, right? Sure, it's not written in the law, and the law might actually say that it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of, of race or color, or gender in terms of education. That last part of gender like doesn't actually, isn't outlawed until much later in the 1954. But just because the law says that you can't do these things doesn't mean that they don't happen anyways. Detroit's post-war housing situation is a really good example of racialized barriers being enforced through segregation, even though arguably, depending on who you go to, segregation either is or is not legal. There are many number of ways to, to prevent someone of a different ethnic or racial background from buying a house in your neighborhood, even if there is an ordinance that, that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of race or color. All of this is to say, of course, that in 1954, with the end of the second Red Scare, with the labor movement moving to kind of merge between the AFL and CIO, with continued calls for civil rights, with the civil rights movement being incredibly important, the labor movement at the same time finds its, hand, it finds its hands bound. It's less and less able to kind of act on these calls for social justice because they're increasingly turning to this post-war business unionism. So how does this spell out specifically? Well, if you abandon calls for a union, right to, union rights to have a say in hiring and firing, that diminishes a union's ability to challenge discriminatory, discriminatory practices in employment. There are a lot of black women and other marginalized workers 
who wanted to pursue skilled trades as a way for better pay or for you know, more secure employment. You uh, recall our discussions of this labor aristocracy. If you have a skill or if you have a specialized craft in an industry, that makes you, one, more employable. Two, it makes you more secure in that employment. And three, it usually leads to better compensation, right? Well, what happens when, when these, these trades apprenticeships, uh, training programs offered by the company, what happens when they keep on passing over marginalized workers, right? Does a union have, a, have the means to, to contest that discrimination? It depends. Is the, is the skilled trades apprenticeship run by the company or by the union? If it's run by the union, does everyone in the union support integration? Does it support equal opportunity to those, those apprenticeships? Discrimination on the basis of race and employment wasn't made illegal until 1964 with the Civil Rights Act. There's a different Civil Rights Act in 1968 that makes it illegal to discriminate on the basis of housing. But again, de facto segregation wasn't necessarily something that you could just do away with by signing a law. Let's... So if a union doesn't have the, or if a union has a diminished ability to negotiate on the terms of hiring and firing and promotions, you might think, well, that's not so bad. You know, over time, eventually, these things will work itself out. Obviously, America is moving towards a post-racial society. By 2016, race won't be an issue anymore. But what about, what about a union's right to have a say in how a company organizes itself in the productive process? Unions can actually end up limiting their own security, especially as companies start to hold back on investing in aging factories and start looking for other places to build new production facilities. So in World War II, you have a lot of scientific breakthroughs that usually happens in a war. One side tries to get the edge over the other with scientific advancement, improvements in, the, in industry and in the productive process. You know, if we can make more tanks than Nazi Germany, then obviously we're going to we're gonna win this war. It's kind of reductionist, it's kind of a simple way of looking at it, but essentially if you look at World War II, it was very much decided as a war for resources and industry. In the post-war era, you have a lot of these aging factory, uh, these aging factories in places like Detroit, five stories tall, they were built in the 1900s. And it's very hard to fit some of these new labor-saving machines in there, right? It's very hard to lift them up by a crane and put them on the third floor where there is room for them. So a lot of these companies, instead of investing in these old buildings, start to look at other places to build new factories. Well, what happens to a union that is tied to a community when that factory, when the owners of that factory decide to close that plant and open a new one somewhere else? Depending on how a union uh, negotiates what's, what are management rights and what are collective bargaining issues, it's entirely possible that that union has no possible recourse against a factory closure. So in case I didn't already uh, raise this issue and repeat myself um, kind of enough here, but because of their reduced access to high paying manufacturing jobs, a lot of black workers and other marginalized workers suffer from precarious employment. Because of racialized and sexist hiring policies, uh, marginalized workers have reduced seniority and job time. This stems from employment discrimination. And so when there are these post-war layoffs, right, when these businesses do kind of step in and say, well, you know, we don't need as many workers and the unions aren't, you know, they don't have the ability to bargain over this management right, right, of we don't need this many workers. We don't need um, all of these people who, who we had previously employed. Now that the union has said that's our right to kind of determine this, that they, they can't really bargain on this issue, who's going to be fired first? It's usually going to be the people with less seniority and job time. It's usually going to be those marginalized workers, either along the, 
uh, lines of ethnicity, race, or gender. This gave rise to the saying by many black workers that they were, quote, the last hired and first fired. If you've ever heard that term, it kind of comes from this post-war uh, era of discrimination, but has its, uh, has its origins in earlier times too, um, with uh, racial class and gender animosity in the labor movement. So while you have the labor movement saying that the civil rights movement is important, and they may have been offering verbal support for the civil rights movement, by kind of moving uh, and pivoting towards business unionism, the degree to which labor unions can actually advocate and, and work with the, the civil rights movement and other progressive social causes starts to be diminished. Obviously, the reduced power of unions through Taft-Hartley only really help exacerbate this issue. So let's talk about now really quickly, this idea of a union management rights and de facto discrimination. Now throughout the 1920s, into the 1930s and throughout World War II, a lot of African-American black workers were leaving the Southern United States. Part of this was basically to get away from Klan terrorism and Jim Crow segregation. But families also moved to a lot of northeastern cities like Detroit to seek out economic opportunity, right? Especially in World War II and leading up to World War II, when some of these uh, giant manufacturers like GM, Ford, Chrysler, or if United States Steel, right, this kind of this uh, successor to Carnegie Steel, this huge steel producer, Goodyear tires, right? If all of these companies are starting to hire well-paying manufacturing jobs, that promises a lot of economic opportunity. And so people start to come north during the Great Migration. And when they arrive in northeastern cities like Detroit, they face a lot of discrimination in housing. Not only in education and employment, but housing specifically, it's a very tight market. There's not a lot of available housing in a city whose population is doubling over the course of about 10 years. So establishing integrated communities in these cities are very hard fought efforts. Even if in some places, du jour segregation and du jour segre or discrimination, right? Even if discrimination is legally outlawed, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't discriminate uh, through other means. In Detroit, you have a lot of homeowners associations that specifically, um, you know, in an off the paper kind of tongue in cheek way, tell realtors, you better not sell these houses, these vacant homes to African American families, or you're not going to get, you know, as a realtor, you're not going to get any more tips on which houses are available to sell anymore. Makes, makes realtors and people who are trying to sell their homes kind of complicit in maintaining racial boundaries into previously like all white affluent white neighborhoods. You also have the process of redlining, right? So if you want to move into a city and if you are a person of color and you want to buy a home, well, the only places where you are actually going to be shown homes is in other neighborhoods and communities that are predominantly communities of color. And as it turns out, the Federal Housing Authority is going to systematically look at neighborhoods that are predominantly neighborhoods of color, and they're going to say, well, you know, uh, these areas are slums, these areas uh, aren't that great in terms of property investment, and so we're not going to give you any mortgages or loans to buy a house in these areas. So it actually drives down, uh, you know, black home ownership. So you have this incredible effort by the civil rights movement and by black Americans to establish themselves in livable, integrated neighborhoods. They're being resisted pretty heavily um, by white racists. You've ever heard the phrase, there goes the neighborhood? That's the origin of that term. It's incredibly problematic and racist. So if you didn't know that context, now you do. While all of this is happening, these companies are bringing in new labor-saving machines introduced after the war. 
And instead of opening up new plants, new factories in the Detroit area, they're relocating to areas where land is cheaper, say out in Warren, which is still pretty undeveloped in the 1950s. And instead of these, uh, instead of these very tall multi-story factories that had existed in Detroit, if you go to Milwaukee Junction, which is a little north, um, northeast of campus, you can see some of these older buildings, these multi-story factories. These new machines um, work better when you have just one, one factory, right? Sprawling single story process. You have raw materials at one end, a car comes out the other. You start to have these new factories open up outside city limits. And now African Americans, workers of color, other marginalized workers like single women who had previously been able to go from their homes to work, now suddenly are not able to buy a house in communities where these new factories are located and they face substantial transportation barriers to getting up there. I'm not sure how frequently uh, the Detroit uh, DDOT bus goes from downtown uh, to Mound and, and 13 Mile, but I'm pretty sure that in 1950 that the frequency of that bus trip, if it existed, was much less frequent. So in a way, the inability of labor unions to challenge what's known as capital flight, right? Uh, in an industry leaving an area for another place for any number of reasons, right? Lower, lower land payments is one of them. Because unions can't necessarily challenge this, this capital flight actually contributes to ongoing spatial inequalities in cities like Detroit where African-Americans uh, women workers and other marginalized people are kept in undesirable neighborhoods while more middle-class affluent white workers are kind of allowed um, entry into, into communities that are more affluent and that are more guarded by de facto forms of segregation. You can kind of see a map here of predominantly black neighborhoods in the Detroit area. The red areas which basically almost entirely overlap with these neighborhoods are areas where the FHA would not, uh, would not provide mortgages for. So a union's inab inability to challenge capital flight is in itself kind of a social justice and social reform issue in the 1960s, right? If you are Concerned with the well-being of the civil rights movement, if you want to see the civil rights movement succeed, it would behoove you to support racial equality. But if a union can't do that in terms of factory locations, if it can't do that in terms of hiring, then what can the labor movement do? It really only leads, uh, leaves it with a couple of options, like political support. Now it's worth pointing out that as time goes on, infrastructural improvements, container shipping, and all these other innovations that are made throughout the 1950s and 60s make it possible for factories to begin relocating even further away from these old kind of labor strongholds like Detroit or Cleveland. Pittsburgh is another example where the steel industry was uh, pretty strong. As it becomes easier to relocate a factory to states or other countries even, where there are right to work laws, there are fewer labor protections, there are, uh, there are cheaper prevailing wages, there are fewer forms of, of compensation like benefits, pensions, retirement, these sorts of things, healthcare, where fewer of these, uh, these forms of non-monetary compensation are expected. Factories are eventually going to start leaving the industrial Northeast entirely. This gives rise to these two regions in the United States that we're going to call the Rust Belt and the Sun Belt. Going into the 1970s, more and more factories and industries, instead of just relocating to, uh, relocating to suburban communities where plots of land were cheaper, where there was perhaps less racial unrest, they start to leave these northern states entirely and relocate to the south. In Trenton, New Jersey, there was an enormous um, 
there was an enormous uh, assembly operation. It was like really a connection of plants that was run by RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. They would produce, um, they would produce stereos, a lot of electronics. General Electric had a similar plant in operation. They start to move to places like Kentucky and Tennessee and Missouri. Auto manufacturers similarly start to relocate south. These southern states that start to see manufacturing growth are what we call the Sun Belt. The Rust Belt is where these jobs are leaving from. Grand Rapids, which used to be known as Furniture City, they don't make a lot of furniture now over there anymore. Um, there are a couple of companies like Steelcase that are still headquartered in Grand Rapids. They do some um, furniture manufacturing there, but a lot of manufacturing work starts to leave Grand Rapids and go south to places like North Carolina and Virginia, Georgia even. And these are all places where there are right to work laws that make it less costly for a company to employ workers. But of course the cost of that reduced cost is the fact that workers are making less, that they can't buy as many of the products your company is making, and so you're going to start to see going into the late 1970s a kind of economic contraction. You start to see the US economy uh, growth starts to slow down throughout the 1970s. And this kind of has a feedback loop uh, for companies seeking cheaper and cheaper labor. Um, if this reminds you of the Great Depression at all, you're not the only one to notice this. Some other historians have kind of made similar comparisons, sometimes known as a race to the bottom. So again, while well, the business union approach enables for the precipitous growth of the middle class in the American, in the United States, um, you also see a reduction of union power that ultimately kind of reinforces the ability of managers to drive down the labor movement while at the same time stymieing kind of the success of the civil rights movement. So just refer to uh, refresh on a couple of terms here. Capital flight is when a business or company or you know a collection of financial assets. Capital flight is when those things leave an area. It's usually to relocate to another location. Sometimes it can be because a company goes out of business, right? A bankruptcy is declared. When capital flight starts to happen, like kind of on a mass scale, when entire industries start to leave an entire region. This is known as deindustrialization. This is what starts to happen to the Rust Belt as industries move out of the industrial Northeast and the Appalachian regions to a lesser extent and toward these Southern United States where infrastructure improvements, advances in technology, you know, the, the construction of road networks make it easier and easier for them to do business there. Deindustrialization is the process of social and economic change caused by the reduction of industrial activity in an area specifically you know, heavy industry or manufacturing like auto production. On the right here, you'll see two, uh, two pictures of this earlier capital flight trend where these larger multi-story factories are abandoned for predominantly like single story sprawling complexes. The two buildings you see here are actually only, uh, you know, 10 or 15 miles apart. The first one is on mound and eight mile. So uh, I believe Warren truck and the bottom is uh, the Packard plant. And then again, the Rust Belt is this name that we kind of give to the industrial Northeast following uh, the process of deindustrialization where a lot of these industries start to relocate southward. The Sun Belt is where a lot of these industries are going to places where workers protections are not as uh, is noticeable, where prevailing wages and compensation are less, where segregation is not legally, uh, is not as legally embattled and challenged. So let's, now that we have all this out of the way, there are a lot of structural changes taking place. Uh, there are a lot of, there's a pretty massive shift in the labor movement away from social unionism and towards business unionism that comes with the merger of the AFL-CIO with the failure of Operation Dixie and kind of uh, Taft-Hartley 
you know, the union, the labor movement tries to repeal it. It is ultimately unsuccessful in doing so. And then with the Red Scare kicking up kind of unions, you've put even more on the defensive. All of these structural changes in the rise of business unionism kind of lead to this, uh, this state of, of just stasis, right? Unions very much become static as they become more and more preoccupied with preserving the, the benefits and wages of their members instead of actively trying to grow the labor movement. This isn't to say that there isn't organization going on, but it's definitely taking a backseat role to unions trying ways to really grapple with and combat deindustrialization and capital flight with the means that are left available to them. Now, with all of this going on, the labor movement starts to see increased calls for reform over how unions represent workers, right? Activists start to call for unions to prioritize issues. Um, that challenge wider problems that workers are facing in society instead of these day-to-day -day business union affairs. In the United Auto Workers, one of the best examples of these kind of rank-and-file rebellions where workers start to get together and challenge their own union, right, the bureaucratic nature of their own union, what they see is, is an undemocratic union that's, that's become less and less responsive to their, to their needs is the Dodge, Revol Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement. Acronym is called DRUM, kind of the subject focus of that book that I mentioned at the start of the lecture, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying. DRUM was established at Chrysler's Dodge main plant in Hamtramck, but their message caught on with a lot of people and it quickly started to spread to other areas. They adopted, of course, their, their own names. There was uh, a plant um, on Mac, uh, it was like the Mac Eldon stamping plant. Um, they took the name Elgrum, if I recall correctly. Uh, there was a, uh, a revolutionary union movement in, within Ford. It was called FRUM or FRUM. Um, other workers in the, in the newspaper industry formed their own revolutionary union movement. And so revolutionary union movements uh, within the labor movement ultimately came together and formed kind of a, uh, their own, I wouldn't say labor federation, but their own kind of competing caucus with, with existing union bureaucracies. And the organization they ultimately created was the Revolutionary Black Workers or LRPW. Now, in contrast to the business unionism of these larger post-war unions like the UAW, the USW, DRUM and other uh, member organizations in the LRBW adopted what's known as this social union approach, right? They wanted social unionism. The idea that the labor movement shouldn't only focus on the needs of the unionized, organized workers, but should respond to the needs of the working class overall. In addition to the social approach, the LRBW hotly contested incidents of racism, not only on the shop floors of factories, but within union halls themselves, where racial favoritism often excluded black workers. At this time, and for some time afterward, it's worth mentioning, a lot of industrial labor unions and local union, uh, industrial union halls were kind of decried by the marginalized as boys clubs specifically white boys clubs, right? If you wanted to be the president or the vice president or the treasurer or a secretary or some position within your union local, you probably weren't going to get that position unless you were a white man. That's just racism and sexism as a pervasive social and cultural force influencing social and cultural organizations in society. If a society has a huge problem dealing with racism, then labor unions are also going to have to deal with racism. So the LRBW, in addition to operating, uh, calling for social unionism, is also calling for anti-racism within the labor movement. This actually wins them quite a few enemies. The LRBW ultimately starts driving this point home, making these demands known through a wide range of actions they take, right? They call for wildcat strikes to draw attention to workers' safety concerns in these dilapidating plants. It's just one of these things. There are protests that they conduct outside of convention halls, union meetings, 
the LRBW um, drum specifically, but the LRBW as a whole famously protested the UAW Constitutional Convention in the late 1960s. The UAW responded by recording the license plate numbers of the protesters, passing that off to union locals in hopes of kind of silencing their activist critics. In the late 1960s, early 1970s, Drum seals themselves into plants like Dodge, Maine to conduct wildcat strikes. They halt auto production in these places for a few days to call attention to the entrenched racism in the, in the union movement, the entrenched racism practiced by management as well, uh, the perceived collaboration between the unions, the business unions, and the manufacturers, and to demand safety reforms in some of these old aging plants that had led to a number of worker deaths. Instead of supporting the LRBW and encouraging the company to hear their concerns out and listen to them, the UAW sends in a group of, of activists known as the Flying Squadrons. The UAW's Flying Squadron was basically a an organization of members that would go join picket lines of other groups to, to offer solidarity, to offer support on the picket lines to make sure pickets were manned in times of strikes. Instead, the flying squadrons forced their way into the Dodge main plant, beat up the sit downers and dragged them out of the factory so that workers could go into Dodge main and, and resume auto production. That contrasts pretty sharply with what the UAW was doing 30 years earlier, right? In the end of the 1930s, the UAW was occupying major plants owned by GM and Ford and Chrysler in order to win workers representation and bargaining rights. 30 years later, at the end of the 1960s, they are not doing that. By the mid-1970s, though, despite its upsurge in growth, the LRBW starts to fall apart, and this is for a number of reasons. Um, there's some factional disputes and some infighting. Uh, the, the rapid growth and success of the LRBW leads a lot of people to begin arguing, you know, should this be a, a labor movement issue, or should we try and form a, uh, a third political party that's more focused on the labor movement and workers' rights? feel like the U.S. is constantly always searching for a third party and it has yet to find one. But there were some in the LRBW who wanted to turn it into a political movement. There were some in the LRBW who wanted to basically uh, set up themselves as a competing union against the UAW, which the UAW and the rest of the labor movement would likely decry as dual unionism. Others still said that the LRBW should remain within the UAW as a reform caucus, right? We should, you know, if, if we can't get the company to negotiate with us directly, maybe we can vote the people in charge of the UAW out and replace them with people who will demand uh, to discuss and negotiate over things like plant closures, racist hiring pre uh, policies, preferences for white workers in, in firing and seniority issues. So there's some, there's some schisms, right? There are people who, who leave the LRBW to form their own organizations. There are people who ultimately just lose their jobs because the plants they were working in close. 1980s Dodge Main closes. Uh, you can't go see it now because part of where it used to stand is now where the new GM Hamtramck assembly is. So it's worth pointing out that GM's Hamtramck assembly was almost closed a couple years ago and it employs far fewer workers than Dodge Main ever did. So a lot of people lose their jobs because of deindustrialization. A lot of people lose their jobs because even though Michigan doesn't deindustrialize when this specific plant closes, it might open up way out there in Lake Orion where black workers don't have a means to get to. So over time, the popularity of the LRBW and its, and its power start to decline. Some people contest that the LRBW started to decline because the UAW started taking uh, 
organizational racism more seriously. Whether or not you agree with that statement, also very hotly uh, debated and contested by people who lived through uh, these times. But by the end of the 1970s, the LRBW was essentially a defunct organization. Activists who were involved in DRUM would continue uh, working against racism, racist hiring policies, and um, racist city policies. They would continue to fight for a more social unionist orientation of the labor movement. General Baker, who was the de facto leader of the LRBW, continued his activist work until his death in 2014, when he was just 72. And actually, um, I want to close with a video of General Baker speaking about solidarity and the difference between the labor movement and the union movement. If I can add that on to the end of this lecture, I will. Otherwise, I will upload it as a separate video for everyone to watch on campus. But he has some pretty interesting uh, insights on the history of the labor movement that I would encourage everyone to listen to. So we've talked about the, a lot about the UAW, right? This is for a good point. The UAW is, uh, during this time anyway, is kind of the premier labor union in the country. Um, at various points, it's going to have anywhere between 1.5 and 2 million members. Today, it has far fewer than that. But it really kind of sets the standard, you know, with the Treaty of Detroit, with supporting the civil rights movement, albeit in a limited fashion, but still doing so. It's able to guide a lot of the labor movement in in a similar direction to the one it follows. And so it's why it kind of takes center stage here. But there are other unions with other labor, uh, with other labor rebellions going on, right? Drum and the LRBW in Detroit are not, uh, are not all there is for rank and file rebellion in the 1970s. The United Mine Workers is another example where workers challenged corruption and claims of cooperation between management and the union going against the workers' interests. Now, to remind you, the United Mine Workers of America, or UMWA, it disaffiliated from the CIO during World War II. In 1955, when a the AFL and the CIO went to merge, the UMWA actually was a, was a pretty loud critic of this. They looked at 1955 and said, all of these things, the CIO left the AFL to, to remedy, right? Um, the AFL, criticisms of the AFL being undemocratic, criticisms of the AFL being, uh, being discriminatory against workers of color, against women workers, the AFL being corrupt. Of course, the CIO, the CIO um, would make this charge as well. All of these things that the CIO was contesting about the AFL hadn't been fixed. And if the CIO is going to join the AFL, then it's really just going to be doing damage to itself. The UMWA continued to remain its own independent union, even after this merger. And the UMWA wouldn't actually join the AFL-CIO until 1989. So it spent the better part of the, of the, the second half of the 20th century Really, it spent the better part of the 20th century being its own independent union, not really tied to any of these larger labor federations. Now, in 1969, a lot of people were looking at the, the state of mines, the state of mine, uh, mine workers, state of the coal industry, workers' compensation, workers' benefits. And there was a lot of growing discontent about how effectively they were being represented by the UMWA. Some of this wasn't necessarily tied to a, a business unionism versus social unionism debate. A lot of it was just tied to charges of corruption and of union kind, uh, kind of collaborating with management to basically agree on bad, uh, bad contracts that didn't benefit workers, but you know. Uh, folks at the top of the UMWA might get a couple of uh, a couple of kickbacks. In 1969, workers in the UMWA were actually so upset with this trend that they encouraged uh, 
one unionist, Joseph Yablonsky, to run against the president of the UMWA. His name was William Boyle. This is only after there were like repeated calls for reform and changes and greater de demo uh, democratization within the UMWA to be implemented. They went unanswered. William Boyle had a very, uh, he's up there at the, uh, at the top left. Yablonsky is bottom right. Boyle had a very uh, hard-nosed, my way or the highway uh, reputation about him. In the 1969 election, Boyle beat Yablonsky by a two to one ratio. Gets 66% of the vote. Yablonsky gets only 33% of the vote. It's kind of suspect because Yablonsky had a lot of support behind him. A lot of people started to wonder if maybe the election was, was fair, right? Was the, were all the votes counted or was there fraud in the selection process? And this isn't like a 2020 election where very clearly there wasn't. In 1969, this specific election, like the 66 to 33% shocked a lot of people. And so while Yablonsky conceded defeat, he went to the Department of Labor and asked that they investigate the election to see if there were actual incidents of fraud. And in addition to this, he filed a number of civil suits against the UMWA regarding their conduct in running the election, saying, hey, there are some things that the UMWA was doing that just don't sit well with a lot of people, and we would like the, the Department of Labor to investigate. Now, in response to this pressure, instead of Boyle meeting with Yablonsky or allowing the Department of Labor to conduct their investigation unfettered, uh, he instead takes embezzled union funds and uses those funds to hire gunmen to assassinate Yablonsky. And they do that. On New Year's Eve in 1969, Yablonsky, his wife, and his 23, I believe, not sure of her age, but she was in her early 20s. Uh, Yablonsky, his wife, and his 23-year-old daughter are murdered while they're sleeping in bed. A couple days later, in the, uh, the early weeks of 1970 at Yablonsky's funeral, friends and family and other union allies who had kind of worked with him in his 1969 election bid, they meet in the basement of the church uh, where his funeral is being held and they decide to form their own rank and file group uh, called Miners for Democracy. This was to do a number of things. One, they wanted to keep civil suits and the, ele uh, the electoral investigation of the UAW, UMWA, and to, they wanted to keep those going. The fear was now that Yablonsky is dead, if there wasn't an active plaintiff kind of asking the Department of Labor to investigate the, the election, that they might have dropped the issue. So the Miners for Democracy was formed to basically keep pressure on the Department of Labor to continue their investigation, but also. Um, one, to see if Boyle was behind it, and two, if he was behind it, to bring charges against him. Now, after lengthy court battles with the UMWA and the Department of Labor, as well as factional disputes within the Miners for Democracy movement itself, after all of these things uh, are happening, and um, eventually the 1969 election results are thrown out. The Department of Labor says, yep, there is fraud. You have to have a new election. And so a new presidency election was held a couple years later in 1972. And Arnold Miller, the candidate that Miners for Democracy uh, put forward, ends up defeating Boyle. Boyle is ultimately sentenced to life in prison for his role in the Yablonsky killings, and he stays in prison from 1972 till 1985 when he finally passes away. Now, Arnold Miller's presidency, you see him there at the bottom right, was somewhat controversial. A lot of mine workers who had called for reform within the UMWA were doing so because they were facing uh, they were facing coal companies refusing to do anything about black lung. Um, there were incredibly poor wages despite the the economic success of the coal industry. And so miners and their families wanted these issues addressed. And this more or less falls into the realm of business unionism, right? We want pay and we want working conditions to be better. Um, in a lot of coal mines, 
all the union would necessarily ask for was these hydration, these water fountains. The idea being that you have like when you're breaking up coal rocks, you have all this coal dust floating around in the air. And so you pump sprinklers, you pump water into, into the air and that catches this coal dust and it makes it kind of fall down to the floor so you're not breathing it in. If you ever see people, demol or if you ever see a building demolition, when we had the, the DeRoy apartments on campus, when they were demolished over the summer last year, they had these water cannons going over, going over the building and it was to prevent these fine particles from this, from this concrete dust from going into the air and getting in people's lungs. It's not an incredibly costly uh, safety thing to put into the mines, but it was something that mine operators absolutely refused to do. Miller's presidency adopted more of the social unionism approach, however. And a lot of people in the UMWA actually resisted Miller's approach. They said, we want you to take care of black lung and, they want, and we want you to take care of our abysmally low pay as minors. We don't necessarily care. I mean, we very well might care about the civil rights movement, but that isn't why we voted for you to replace Boyle, right? So a lot of people ended up criticizing Miller because they didn't view him as a very effective leader or they looked at his social, uh, social union advocacy, his support for things like women's equality and the civil rights movement. And you know, they had claimed the union had fallen into radical hands. So while Miller did successfully win re-election in 1977, five years later, the popularity of Miners for Democracy began to wane. And they themselves ended up getting boxed in by existing contracts that either were negotiated before they took power or were negotiated in their first wave of negotiations with mine operators that kind of limited how much they could actually demand and fight for. And of course, all of this was only exacerbated by American, the American coal industry's further decline. As we get further and further into 70s, the US is going to become more and more dependent on fossil fuels, less dependent on coal, especially as environmental concerns start to take increasing importance in American politics. And so in contrast to the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, that doesn't see a lot of success because there is kind of, uh, in addition to all of these problems facing the labor movement, in addition to deindustrialization, they also have to deal with entrenched racial discrimination. The League of Revolutionary Black Workers doesn't have that much success. Miners for Democracy does, but these same kinds of social and economic pressures on the labor movement ultimately mean that even when they do win, win, win union power, when they do win control of the UMWA, they're not able to really use it that effectively. And it's because of this business union approach really taking center stage in the labor movement. So we've talked a little bit, we focused a little bit on the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. We focused a little bit on Miners for Democracy, there were other organizations that were created in the long 1970s as well, basically to challenge all of these issues that workers uh, started, to, started to call increasing attention to, right? Is our union really democratic or are they deciding on contracts without giving us proper chance to voice our concerns and make our voices heard? Are these unions bureaucratic? Are they working with the companies they're supposed to be negotiating us? negotiating with for us? Are our unions adequately fighting racist and sexist policies or are they not really caring that much? The International Brotherhood of Teamsters faced similar challenges and had its own anti-corruption caucus known as the Teamsters for a Democratic Union. We're not going to get too much into the TDU today, but the TDU remains a, a vocal force within the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. It's also worth noting that social unionism and social union, social movement unionist activity gives rise to some labor unions that hadn't existed before. The United Farm, Work Farm Workers, which sought to organize migrant farm workers and other agricultural workers following its 1962 founding, grew rapidly as it went into a strike in the 1970s 
The UFW wins the famous Delano Great Strike, or La Huelga, in, 19, in 1970. I believe they signed their first contract. Cesar Chavez actually wants to capitalize on the UFW's initial victory and begins expanding the focus of the union to turn it into what he wants is, quote, a national union of the poor serving the needs of all who suffer. It's a very social unionist uh, stance to take. But this leads others within the UFW to criticize Chavez's leadership or withdraw from the union entirely because they felt the UFW was moving too far away from farm workers' concerns. If you go out of your way to organize tenants in Los Angeles or work with uh, ranchers in Wyoming, and you are not adequately representing migrant farm workers in California or Arizona, then why am I like, why am I as a farm worker going to be a part of your union, right? I need better pay, I need medical care. How is the UFW winning these things for me? And we're going to get uh, into a much deeper discussion on the United Farm Workers toward the end of the semester. That's kind of our, our next reading. If you're looking ahead is Lettuce Wars, once we're done with Manhood on the Line. We are actually done with Manhood on the Line by the time you're hearing this. So in spite of all of the things we can say about business unionism, the idea that it ties the hands of the labor movement into not really being able to to push labor organizing, to push social unionism, to push the concerns of the wider working class as a whole, even though we can have all of these criticisms of business unionism, we can turn around and look at social unionism and see that when social unionists start to gain control of labor organizations, a lot of times they simply do not have the power, the resources, or the, the availability to commit to both representing their members in a way that they deem meaningful and at the same time advocating for organizing other workers. This is going to be the central topic in our next lecture, which is organizing the unorganized. So keep that in mind. Should a union's primary, primary goal be the well-being and economic security of its members? Or should it be the well-being and security of the working class as a whole? Who pays the dues, but by organizing who can you increase the success of the labor movement? Again, all of these are questions that we don't necessarily have one objective answer to, and there's a lot of debate about these going on still. During this time, the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association, workers involved in both unions that kind of represent primary, secondary, and post-secondary educators, will conduct a series of strikes that are not technically legal because they are public employees. Especially when urban cities start to see budget shortfalls because of all this capital and white flight out of, out of urban areas, schools that had normally been able to provide students with pretty good educations, suddenly have to make some pretty sharp cutbacks, right? Tax revenues are down because everyone's leaving the cities for these all white suburbs. So you're gonna have to take a pretty stark cut in pay. Also, you're gonna need to have to take on a bunch of extra students. Also, you have to provide your own pencils. Teachers in the 1970s don't really appreciate this and they start going on strike. But public employed teachers striking in the 1970s were often decried by their opponents as these types of inner, inner city welfare queens who were just, you know, they didn't really care about the students. They just wanted uh, more money so they could, you know, pay for their homosexual dance lessons or whatever the, you know, whatever people thought unionized teachers did in their off time. Going into the 70s, some industrial unions actually saw the entrenched and perceived undemocratic nature of the AFL-CIO as kind of an existential threat to the labor movement. In order to remedy this in 1968, the UAW and the Teamsters both withdrew from the AFL-CIO and created their own labor, labor federation called the Alliance for Labor Action, or ALA. So kind of similarly to how the CIO left the AFL 
the UAW and the IBT leave the AFL-CIO to create the ALA. And they're not alone. Some smaller uh, organizations leave with the AFL-CIO and join them. The Alliance for Labor Action, or ALA, wanted to kind of return to this pre-Red Scare social unionism in the labor movement and focus much more on organizing workers who had not been organized. Some of these workers could be in or outside of their industries. It didn't really matter because the idea was that by organizing and unionizing more and more of the workforce, you would grow the labor movement to the point where social unionism and business unionism together could be a viable option like it had been before Taft-Hartley. Now, optimism for the ALA was actually pretty high, but the effort ultimately fails, but for different reasons than CIO's earlier Operation Dixie. One, both of the labor movement leaders that had kind of blazed the trail for the ALA die. Also, the political power of major industrial unions like the UAW and the IBT had started to wane. As more and more of union represented factories started to move toward the South where they didn't have union recognition, the membership of industrial unions like the UAW or the USW or the UMWA or all of these other industrial unions would start to decline. Today, the UAW only has about 700,000 members, but well over half of them are retirees. They're not actively working. In terms of active workers, the UAW, I believe, has about 300,000 members, which is in sharp contrast to its almost 2 million in the 1950s. Now you have folks like Walter Ruther who, well, as head of the UAW, he is uh, in pursuing a more business unionist approach for much of his tenure as president, is being decried by Drum and the LRVW as being complicit in racism. He's not challenging racism enough. Ruther at the same time is looking at the then head of the AFL-CIO, George Meany, and says, you're not doing enough to actively confront racism. The AFL-CIO is not doing enough to fight for civil rights. In 1968, it's actually believed that the, that the impetus for the ALA was first created because the only two national union leaders who were present at Martin Luther King's funeral were Walter Ruther and Jimmy Hoffa, who was the president of the Teamsters. In 1970, though, Walter Ruther uh, is on a plane ride to Black Lake, which is where the UAW uh, meets over the summer. His plane goes down, and he and his wife die in the plane crash at Black Lake. There's a lot of mystery surrounding the actual plane crash. Uh, the investigation that took place after the fact um, noted that a lot of the instrumentation, like the barometric instruments, things that are used to fly a plane safely and land a plane safely were tampered with. So some unionists um, looked at that sort of situation and said, well, obviously Ruther was murdered. In terms of who, no one really knows. Even if he was murdered is still something that can be debated. Um, but no charges or investigation was ever followed up. Jimmy Hoffa, um, but a year later is imprisoned for corruption. And even though the Teamsters continued to advocate for social unionism in the ALA to a limited extent, the initiative eventually runs out of funds in 1972 and the ALA is abandoned. Hoffa, of course, disappears in 1975 before he's legally declared dead in 1982. Some people say the mob, the, the mafia, probably had him killed because of some money that he owed other explanations are out there. We still don't know where Hoffa is. Um, there's a pretty uh, recurring urban legend that he's buried under one of the seats of uh, Comerica Park Stadium. Either way, the UAW ultimately rejoins the AFL-CIO in 1981, and the Teamsters six years later in 1987. So it's worth kind of closing with some takeaways here. One, rank and file efforts by union members to influence the decisions and of leadership require grassroots organizing and substantial commitment on the part of reformers. 
Beyond stereotypical understandings of the 1970s as a time of general rebellion and discontent, dissenting unionists had clear vocal concerns about the labor movement's relationship with civil rights, gender equality, and democratic self-government. And lastly, additionally, questions on whether or not a union should prioritize the needs and interests of its members over the working class overall added controversy and are still controversial topics for the labor movement today, right? Do we pursue a business unionist approach or a social unionist approach? It depends on what your priorities are. And then wrapping up again with some vocabulary to make sure that you kind of retain some of this information, but the Treaty of Detroit was that long-term five-year contract between the UAW and the big three, where the UAW agrees to recognize some management rights in exchange for bargaining uh, on wage increases and extensive benefits, is, which is an example of business unionism, the idea that a, that a labor union should primarily concern itself with the workplace issues, such as workplace safety, wages, and worker benefits for its members. This is in contrast to earlier social unionism, which argues that the labor movement should concern itself and even prioritize the welfare of the working class as a whole. And while all these debates are going on, you have additional stressors being put on the labor movement, like capital flight, which is when a business, a company, or financial assets leave an area. And when that happens a lot, in terms of entire industries living in an entire region, you have deindustrialization. Deindustrialization has a lot of industries like the auto industry, the steel industry. They all start to leave places like the Rust Belt, the industrial Northeast where labor and manufacturing had previously been based, to relocate to the Sun Belt, states in the South and Southwest where labor laws were less strict, where unions had less of a voice and ultimately prevailing wage and benefits compensation was lower. So for next class, um, go ahead and read Loomis's 10 Strikes, Chapter 8, that's Lordstown and Workers in a Rebellious Age. And make sure to read Fowes' uh, Rethinking Chapter 5 that covers lost opportunities from 1961 to 1981. That overlaps a lot with that long 1970s period we talked about. And make sure before the 16th or the day of the 16th, if you like to play it risky, uh, to turn in the second term paper benchmark assignment, and that's that tentative bibliography, that works cited page that you're going to be using for your uh, term papers. As always, if you have any questions, I will be available during office hours on Zoom or just send me a, a message on Canvas or an email directly if those times don't work and we can set up a, a meeting independent of those times. I'm wishing you all the best and uh, thanks for listening to this lecture. <laughs>